Welcome back to another episode of the Adversity Advantage. I'm your host, Doug Bobst, and today's guest is Rachel Hollis. Rachel is the number one New York Times bestselling author of books such as Girl, Wash Your Face, Girl, Stop Apologizing, and more. She is also a motivational speaker and hosts the highly popular The Rachel Hollis Podcast. Rachel is also the founder of The Hollis Company, a media company that helps give people the tools to make positive changes that last. I'm super excited for this conversation, and I think y'all are going to get a lot out of it. So please help me in welcoming Rachel Hollis to the Adversity Advantage podcast. Hi, how are you? I'm good. I'm so happy that you're here. It's great to see you again, and thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, oh my gosh. Thank you for having me. I know it's been a minute trying to get the time to do this, so I'm glad that we're getting to sit down today. Me too, because I feel like there's a there's a lot to chat about. There's a lot, I guess, to catch people up on because so much has transpired over the last couple of years in both of our lives, but I think more so publicly with yours, which we will definitely get into. But I think a good place to start is your mental health between going to the aiming clinics and, and doing some healing work and doing the inner child work and different things. Like, like, why has that been so important for you to do? Was it just specifically because of the divorce? Was it the pandemic? Or like, like, why has that been a big mission for you? Yes, uh, all. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that I think we all sort of I hope we all in the last, you know, 18 months to two years have really looked at the things that have worked in our lives, like what was working and how do we evolve those areas and what were the things that hasn't worked. Um, specifically for me, my emotions felt very out of whack. I would say in the last couple of years and I understand, or the last three years, and I understand now having done all this work, kind of why it was happening the way that it was. But at the time, I didn't know. I just felt like my anxiety was coming back. I felt like I'd done all this work to overcome my anxiety and learn to manage it better. And I was really starting to experience more and more anxiety. I was having a hard time controlling, like I was getting really upset or I was crying a lot, just like my emotions felt all over the place. And I have a lot of mental illness in my family. My older brother was schizophrenic and he took his own life. And the big part of my story, and honestly, probably a big fear of mine is having mental health issues grow worse over time. And so I tend to be really on top of those things. So I was trying everything to figure out what was going on. And that was really why I went on the journey was I just knew something was off, but I didn't know what it was. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't know that with what happened with your brother, and that's awful. And I'm I'm so sorry that that happened to you. But I think hopefully there's been some peace with all that, and how maybe this has maybe been a, a motivator for you to continue to work on your own mental health, and then also inspire others to to make that choice for themselves to if they're struggling with something to to reach out, ask for help, and do the necessary things to to really you know not only just heal themselves, but heal themselves so that other parts of their life can heal as well. And I know over the last few years, it's been publicly hard for you, I think, with the divorce and kind of the disconnect between you and what happened with with your fans and the public outrage and everything. So what has been some of the things that you've had to work on internally to like to heal from from all of that? Like like how have you helped how have you like helped to rebuild your own confidence, your own self-esteem? when it came to that situation? You know, it's, it's two different things, but also because I have a public persona, things are happening in the public space. Um, So if the average person, like, you know, if your friend gets divorced, you don't have thousands of people saying awful things about her and the divorce simultaneously. So it was like a two part thing. You're dealing with navigating divorce, navigating children through divorce, and also what's happening publicly. I mean, therapy is like everything. And Mm -hmm. I think that if I hope that if I've done anything in my work over the last decade plus, it's normalizing therapy for my community. I've talked about it a ton. I've been in therapy on and off since I was 14 years old. Just the ability to speak with someone and get help and get perspective is a huge thing for me. But also, I really believe mental health is something you look at 360 degrees. So it's not just one thing. You really try and approach it every way that you can. So, um, you know, I look at stress relief. So things for me like running or doing yoga or meditation to make sure those become a daily practice to really help me counterbalance what's going on in my life. When you talk about 
what happened last April with um, saying something on the internet that was really upsetting to people and definitely wasn't my intention. But my best friend said, there's a big difference between your intent and your impact. And so what I had to learn to deal with was the impact that I had had, even if it wasn't my intent. And honestly, that looked like therapy, but it looked like, what is the work that I need to do as a human being to understand how I made a mistake like this and how I didn't see that this would be hurtful and how I need to better learn or unlearn things that cause this to happen. So it was deeply painful because... I'm really proud of having created a space online where people feel safe to be themselves and they feel seen. And the worst part in that was that people felt like, oh, this is, this is unsafe. Like you don't see me actually. But I know that this sounds crazy or it sounds like, I don't know how this sounds, but I wouldn't take it back Yeah. because I would not be the person that I am today. I wouldn't. I know. I ask myself this all the time. Like the first several months after it, I, I, I just was like in shock. Like, how did this happen? And how did I not see that this would be so upsetting? Cause I didn't, you know? And then I was like, once I got over that, which is just sort of like, whatever, then it became, okay, dude, if you're going to go through this, what are you supposed to learn? Like, this is an opportunity from the universe for you to figure your shit out and to do better. And I, when I look back now, I'm like, I would not, I would not have talked to the people I've talked to. I wouldn't have read the books. I wouldn't have done the studying. I wouldn't have changed my heart. I wouldn't be the mom I am. I wouldn't be the woman I am if I hadn't gone through that thing. So I understand that publicly there can be a perception about me or, and that, I have to hold space for that. That's part of my story and my journey. But I know who I am on the other side of this. And I know my heart. Mm -hmm. And if that's what it took to get to where I am today, I just have to believe that that was, that was part of my unique journey. Thank you so much for, for sharing so vulnerably because I do remember that situation. I think if you're in the personal development space, it was hard to miss that, right? It was very public. And the way you, you've responded now, talking like you've talked to is very admirable to come out and say, like, listen, like I made a mistake. Like I messed up. Like, but here's what I've done since then. And I love how you said the intent versus the the impact because we we all will say, Well, I didn't I didn't mean to hurt you. I didn't intend to, but we did. And we can't change that. Yeah. So I guess yeah. in, your, in your own in this throughout this whole process, have you learned anything as far as how to make sure that you, when you are saying something or you are acting, you are thinking about the impact first versus just the intent, the intent of your, right. what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, I think it's this simple, like I replayed that moment over and over and over in my mind. It's like a, a car accident in my mind. I've played it a thousand times because I just was trying to understand how could I work in this work for so long and really not have understood that it was going to affect people the way that it did. It really comes down to something like this simple, which is I was angry. Mm. I was angry when I made that post. Whatever you put out into the world is what's coming back to you. I was feeling so frustrated and was feeling so honestly, like I had just been living in this world of feeling like I just wasn't getting any of these things right, right? And no matter how hard I worked or, you know, carrying a staff of 60 people on, you know, through pandemic and had an events business and I'm trying to keep all these people employed. And it was like, it felt like no matter what I did, it wasn't enough. And I had been living in that scarcity mindset and that stress for so long. And it was bound to boil out. You know, Dr. Wayne Dyer has this quote I love. He says, if you squeeze an orange, you don't get lemon juice. You squeeze a lime, you don't get orange juice. When something's under pressure, whatever's inside of it will come out. Mm. And I was angry and I was hurt. And that's what happened, right? Like uh, Byron Katie says, uh, defense is the first act of war. So I was angry and I was being defensive. And that's what went out. And guess what came back? anger and defensiveness. And so I just, I, I understand it now. And I think it's as simple as 
if we can't move from a place of love, if I can't create from a place of love, then I shouldn't be doing this work. And it's a, it's a gut check for anybody and everybody to just ask themselves as they go through their day, like, am I doing this from a place of love and integrity? And if I'm not, then I need to stop and take a step back and reevaluate and make sure that I'm in the right frame of mind and the right frame of heart before I put stuff out into the world. So I really, I think too, like I have had these conversations with you and with Jay and different podcasts that I've done and different press interviews that I've done because there's two really important conversations that need to happen here. One is a conversation about white privilege. As a white woman in America, I have to own that and I have to be willing to discuss it. Because if you're afraid and you don't want to admit that you have it, you will not do the work to unlearn it. You will not do the work to make sure that every member of our community is being seen. You will not do the work that your heart needs to do if you're too afraid or you become defensive or you become angry. So I want to have the conversation because that's what it is. And we can't be afraid to talk about it. It's hard and it's painful, but it's real. And it's a conversation we need to be having in this country. The other thing, and the reason that I keep talking about it is because So much of my work, like I've literally been saying for 10 years that I fail. And because I have a public figure, because I'm a public figure, I fail publicly. And then you watch me stand up and learn and do better and go again. And if you've been watching my career, you've seen this again and again and again. And this is a lesson that I needed to learn. And if, you know, my best friend, that weekend that it happened, you know, the first thing she said, she's a black woman. And she called me and she said, Hey, your white woman showing. And I was like, what? Cause I literally didn't know. I didn't know what had happened. And we had a lot of hard conversations about that experience and what had gone down, but I'm not willing to admit when I get it wrong and admit and try and learn and do better. Then I'm setting a bullshit example for my community, right? Because you're just seeing, and this happens a lot in the personal development space. You're just seeing the perfect facade. You know, you're not seeing the evolution. In the last year, my community's seen a divorce and a public failure. And both of those things were part of my evolution. We were talking about this earlier before we started. Like, I think if you're gonna learn from a speaker, a teacher, a coach, a pastor, like You don't want to learn from someone who's like, I got all the answers. I'm living a perfect life. I'm doing this excellently. You want to learn from someone who's like, in real time, I'm a human. I'm messed up. And I'm going to show you what it looks like to own the mistake and learn from it. Because it really is only a failure if you like put your head in the sand and try and pretend it didn't happen. Right. And I I love how you talk about failure because you, you, you essentially talk about it's just a way of life that no matter what you do, um, you're going to fail professionally. You're going to fail personally. You're always going to make mistakes. But what counts is how you respond after that. But there's a lot of people, Rach, that they make these massively big mistakes in their life, right? They could go to jail, for instance. They could get divorced or they could maybe cheat on their partner or they could lose a job. I can just go on with examples. And they let that decision, they let that failure define them for the rest of their life. And they throw their head in the, they throw their head in the sand, throw in the towel and say, you know what, it's over. So like what inspired you to make this comeback? Because I'm, I'm sure it could have, the easy thing could have been right to say, okay, like I'm already probably financially okay. And I've already done a lot. I, I want to focus on my family. I'm going to delete social media and just say, you know what, this isn't for me. So what inspired you to make this comeback? Well, I think I know my purpose, mm. right? Yeah. I believe that my purpose on this earth has been for the longest time and still is that I learn constantly to be a better version of myself. And then I share what I learned in the hopes that it will help someone else. That's my purpose. And back in the day, that was an audience of 10, right? It's a bigger audience today, but the purpose hasn't changed. And learning to be a better version of myself is definitely means that in that process, I'm going to encounter things that are hard lessons. So I don't 
get to decide, like, I don't get to say, oh, I'm only going to show you the stuff that's pretty or cool or like how fucked. Sorry, you can bleep me out. I cuss. There you go. There you go. You're good. You're good. <laughs> say what you want. Okay. Like how fucked is it if I am only willing to do that when it's easy stuff? So I just feel like my entire career would have been a fraud if when I went through really hard things or when I went through big failure, if I did the opposite of what I've been telling people to do for a decade. So I know my purpose. And the thing is, it I didn't start out in this process wanting millions of fans. I, I couldn't even have imagined that. And right now, I'm not... I don't have ego tied up in how many people are listening. I am just living out my purpose and nowhere in my purpose am I saying, and I'm impacting a hundred thousand people nowhere, because I don't believe that I'm in charge of what happens once it's out. I believe that's something divine. That's not my job. My job is to show up and do the best that I can to the best of my ability and someone else is responsible, something else, something greater than me is responsible for what happens with that. So yeah, I think I just, I took time off. And I think that publicly going through something like that, people really want you to have an immediate solution, an immediate answer, an immediate like plan. And I felt like that would be disingenuous. So I took time off, I took several months, and I was just quiet publicly because I wanted to do the work. I wanted to read more. I wanted to talk to more people. I wanted to understand. And I didn't want to create anything until I felt like I had learned not all of the lessons, but some of the things I needed to learn. And when I got back into doing the podcast again, those are really earnest conversations of me sort of going, oh, so, you know, this is where we're at. It's very right. real, like human being stuff. And I'll just keep going back to that place. I think that, you know, people, that's like such a buzzword. People love like, what's your purpose? What's your purpose? But when you really know, and you really feel tied to that purpose, the results are the least of your concern because your goal is, can I live out what I believe I'm here on this earth to do? So well said. And, you know, you're probably one of the most popular you know, well-known female people in the personal development space. I mean, you've spent years inspiring and impacting millions, specifically women, millions of people, men too, but specifically women to feel better, live their best life, help inspire them to get out of whatever hole that they're in. Like, where did you lean? Who did you lean on during the time where now it's Rachel's turn that you're in this, this whole mentally, emotionally, spiritually that you had to climb out of? Like, how did you get out? Like, who did you lean on? Was there a book? Was there a podcast? Was there a certain person? My best girlfriends, I could not have gotten through the last 18 months without them. I couldn't have gotten through the divorce. I could, I can't even imagine. And that particular situation was so interesting because two of my best girlfriends are black women. And so not only are they walking through this thing with their friend, but they're also walking through this thing with their friend that they're disappointed in. Right. And that was like a very real fucking real life family, like thing that we have to work with. And here's the thing publicly, nothing will ever be as painful for me publicly as privately having those conversations with my best friends, nothing. To have disappointed people I love the most is gutting. And uh, my best friend Beans, and I've said this on other podcasts, but she said, you know, people think that we learn in life by like sitting in a classroom and, you know, a teacher teaches us. She's like, no, you really learn when you fuck up big, mm. when you do something that is so painful that it will change everything in your life, that's when you learn the most. So those women are my people. And it looks like a decade of pouring into our friendship and our relationship and us as a group being there for each other through the death of parents, through the birth of babies, through marriage, through divorce, like 
to get to a place where even when it's hard, they're like, we're upset with you, but we're your people. Like we'll get in bed and cry with you because this is what it is to be in community with someone and do life with someone. So they were, they were everything for me during that Mm. time and still are. Oh yeah. I mean, I think having people, people in your life that support and love you unconditionally is amazing. But I think some of that love is tough love and showing constructive criticism and feedback when needed. Like I don't need people in my life to pat me on the back all the time. I need people sometimes to gut check me and be like, dude, you shouldn't have said that. Like, can you, did you, right. did you think about the repercussions or do you think about like how you could have handled the situation better? Cause that's how you grow. Like you don't grow by yep. somebody just patting you on the back and keeping you in your comfort zone. You grow by having these difficult conversations. You grow by admitting when you're wrong, you grow by saying, you know what? Like I messed up. Like I royally screwed up and here's what I'm going to do differently. Here's how I'm going to take action. Here's what I'm going to learn to to grow from it. And that's life, right? Well, I think, you know, it's so interesting. And I say this with um, love and good intention is I don't think it's my job to try and make people understand me. Mm. Because I think that with that aim, that's my ego. Right. Right. And I think that that's probably what was hard for different people who work around me or who work on teams that sort of you know support my books or my podcast or whatever, is people are so desperate for me to make the public feel okay with me again. And all I cared about is my real life people, my friends, my children, my real life people, like those relationships being healed. Because I think that everybody who has any kind of public persona, there's always going to be a a disconnect there. I heard uh, Kenny Rogers say this years ago, he said, we're all, if you have a public persona, you're three people. There's who you think I am. There's who I think I am. And there's who I really am. And they're, they're three totally different things. So people have a perception. Like I have a perception of who the rock is. I don't know the rock. I don't know Dwayne. I know who I think he is based on the cool Instagram posts and the movies that he does. And that's ridiculous. I don't know him as a person. It's funny because I've actually gotten this question a lot since everything happened is hosts will sort of be like, what are people getting wrong? Or what do you say? Like if they don't, and I'm like, oh no, that's not, that's not my, my job. Because I think that gets you, that's just for anybody, right? That's for anybody who's listening to this. If I try and combat public perception of me, that's my ego. Like I'm trying to people please. I'm trying to be everything to every person and make sure that like, you know who I really am. Instead of actually just living my life in a way, uh, living my life with integrity, acting with love, moving with intention, that's what matters to me. And I believe that if I continue to do that, then that's what will resonate in my work. And that's what matters most. I mean, as you were unraveling your explanation for that, it totally makes sense. Because if you're constantly trying to get people to understand your actions and your behaviors and what you're doing, you're right. You are people pleasing. You're trying to get them to adopt this idea of who you want them to think you are, which in reality is just, it's never going to happen. Right. And it's just, and honestly, it's not going to be productive because then you'll start to veer away from who you truly are as a person. And even though that person, you're going to make some mistakes, you're going to, you know, fall and get back up and that's okay. But the minute you try to say, okay, I'm going to act and tiptoe around life just so that everybody around me thinks that I'm this perfect person you start to really lose yourself and you lose yourself fast. And you see that a lot now. You've had your identity, obviously, you know, for, for some time wrapped up in what you've done with, with Dave and the events and everything that you guys have done together to now you're being on your own, you're a single mom. Like, what are some things that you've done to help rebuild your identity of who you are today? I think that a lot of the work I've done post-divorce is about remembering who I've always been. Mm. And respectfully to my ex-husband, I've been an entrepreneur for 18 years, almost 19 years. He came into that process in 2018. I worked a really long time. I wrote a lot of books that nobody cared about. I had a podcast that nobody cared about. I did a lot of work that nobody got or understood, including him, before we made the decision to start to work 
together. The way that it happened and sort of unraveled is that when we started to work together was when Girl Wash Your Face exploded. And so it was like the Hollis Co. and Dave and Rachel Hollis. And he was an incredible partner and incredible support. And we did build a lot of things together. But the career that I have and the person that I am and the work that I do is something that I've been working on for the majority of my adult life. And oftentimes, like most people, I did that in opposition of a partner who didn't really understand what I was trying to do. And and from a place of love, like he has said this, that from a place of love and wanting to protect me, he was just like, why do you keep doing these events that lose money? And why do you write books that nobody reads? And why do you keep trying to like make this stuff work? And I say that because I know there are a lot of people who listen to podcasts who are dreamers and who have goals and who are entrepreneurs. And it's probably the question I get most commonly is what do I do if I have a partner or family or friends who don't support me? And I'm like, welcome to the club. There, there is no magic like, oh, I'll just do these three things and then they'll get it. They'll get the vision. I always say like, if you want their support, you make the vision a reality. Like, I know that that sounds like harsh, but it's true. At least it's true in my story is that lots of people are like, we always knew. And I'm like, BS, dude, you did not. You did it. You thought I was crazy. And then it happened. And now you believe. So for me, it was reminding myself post-divorce that like, dude, you, you built this. And yeah, you had some help, but all of this is, is the vision that I've been working toward for a very long time. And I think that it's easy to feel fear when you, when something that big changes, you're like, oh gosh, I, now I don't have a partner. I don't have anyone to cry to when it's a hard day. I don't have anyone to talk things through with anymore. Like I don't have that thing anymore. And so it was just a reminder to myself of like, okay, let's think of all the times in the past that you got through hard things. Let's think of all the times that you did figure it out. Let's think of the resources that you do have. It's just like a reminder of who you are. And I think it's interesting because from an outside looking in, oftentimes people say that women come to my conferences or come to hear me speak or do my coaching or whatever because they want to become a different version of themselves. And that's not true. Women do not come to become something else. Women come because they want to be reminded who they always were. They want to find power and intention in the nine-year-old girl who had these massive dreams or the 16-year-old who thought that she could get her PhD. They, they want to remember the woman that they always were and learn how to navigate the world as her in their current life. So how did you begin to re- identify like that belief in yourself? Was it, would you like write down certain things you've achieved? Would you visualize like how far you've come? Like what were some of the things that actually got you to believe that coming from a place where you, I'm sure you were so beaten down? Yeah. Lots of journaling. Mm. I'm a big journaler. Um, so I do, um, Julia Cameron calls them the morning oh, yeah. pages. I do morning pages every day. And um, to be honest, during the hardest parts of last year, those morning pages really were, <laughs> oh my gosh, they were abysmal. They were so sad. They were just like, oh, what is happening? And I realized in retrospect that I was manifesting more of the same because every day I was kind of processing how bad things were and how I was feeling and how hard it was. And I think I was just sort of reemphasizing that to myself. And so I kept, I sort of stayed in a loop. And it was when I really became intentional about where I wanted to go and what I wanted to feel like, even if I didn't feel like it yet, that I started to feel myself change and started to feel good and, or, or at least better. So journaling is a big part of it for me. Visualization is also a big thing and is doing gratitude work and doing gratitude work on like putting myself back into a situation. Like, remember what it felt like, you know, the first time that you stood on the stage and like, you knew you had given a really good keynote or remember what it felt like when you got through a hard season with one of your kids. Like I just sort of, and I think it's powerful for anybody to look back on success from the past 
and use that to give you hope and positivity in the future. I love that. And I've had, yeah, Julia Cameron's work, like the artist way, I think is her book, right? I mean, yeah. it's amazing. And I've, yeah. I've tried the morning pages. I haven't been consistent with it, but I've noticed for me that whenever I do it, it's so healing and you'll get through the first like page or two and you're like, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? And all of a sudden like page right. three, it's like, Oh, like something this is why comes out. something comes. I'm like, didn't know that was still there, but it's there. Right. And and you've talked about becoming the, like remembering who you were and achievement and all that stuff. And I've heard you say that like on the other side of some of your toughest seasons has been the, the biggest level of growth for you. So what has been an area in your life that you've seen massive growth in throughout these last 18 months, other than some of the lessons that you learned from what happened on social media? A really interesting perspective that I think listeners who are women who might be able to identify with is I really had a lot of issues and limiting beliefs surrounding finances for me. And I didn't know that I did until I went through divorce. Like it was just so triggering. I grew up really poor and lots of scarcity around money. And I have made a living doing my job for the last very many years. And I hate to admit this, Doug, but like straight up, my ex-husband handled the finances for us and always did. And I was super down. Like I knew ish what was happening, but like not really. And when we got divorced, it was the first time in my adult life, I was doing a lot of things, but I was managing not just money, but like managing money at a higher level and managing business finances at a much higher level. And there was this like devil on my shoulder or old school childhood something that was telling me, you're not smart enough. You don't know how to do this. This is like all, you know, we all have our stuff. And I didn't understand how much stuff I still had in relation to money. And it matters. Like, some people, you know, whatever you want to believe about making money, we, we have to have money to pay our bills and to buy food and to get gas for our cars. And how you like the relationship, the emotional relationship that you have with money and wealth or lack thereof is what determines what you create in your life. Like if you keep self sabotaging, if you keep in the same repetitive cycle, those things are not happening on accident. They're, they're what you create. And I realized that I was like, oh my gosh, I, I have so much stuff to unpack here. So I've done a lot of work in the last year and a half on trying to understand that and trying to identify like, okay, this is like a little girl version of me who's still afraid of this subject and who still thinks that she's going to open the refrigerator and there's not going to be any food in it and there's not going to be money for gas. And so it was really helpful for me to understand what I still needed to learn and how I can do better about not being so fearful around that topic. Because I promise you, if you have fears or anxiety around money, it will affect your money. It will. You'll make decisions that you shouldn't make. Either it just... I could like do an entire podcast on this subject. Um, but I'm really into especially women understanding this because I cannot tell you how many notes I've gotten from women who go through divorce or women who lose their partner and they have no idea what to do, where the money's at. They're terrified. What are they going to do now? I'm in my 60s. I haven't worked, you know, in 40 years. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. So um, one of the keys to fear about finances is just a willingness to look and see where you are. And so uh, it was a, that's been a big thing for me in the last year. So do you think that this like a good solution or a step in the right direction for people? Let's just say that they're married and I mean, hopefully they don't get divorced, but you know, if they do get divorced and they have, they're prepared, is it to be more informed throughout that process and having like weekly meetings or monthly meetings or something with their spouse around what the budget looks like and why they're spending certain money or spending money on certain things? I don't think that this is a bad thing, but this is just like a very true situation. Right. I have made a beautiful living and right. I believe in buying things with cash, right? I don't, um, I don't like debt. It's a part of, it's just my thing. I don't I've like heard, debt. I've heard you say that a lot. This is so dumb, but I'm just going to give you a very true story, Doug. Recently, 
I wanted to get a credit card because Hawaiian Airlines <laughs> is having this special where if you get their credit card and you buy like one cup of coffee, whatever, and pay it off, you get 70,000 miles. That's wild. It's like a crazy deal. This is not an ad, I swear. <laughs> so I, I have an accountant that I work with because that was a big piece for me to like feel secure in myself is like, I'm going to have a professional who just helps me. And I said, <laughs> Hey, I'm going to get this credit card. I'm just letting you know so that you don't think like someone's stolen my social security number, whatever. And I didn't immediately get approved for the credit card. And I'm like, that's wild. I don't have any debt. Like what, what? Because I had to like do extra steps to get approved for this credit card. And so I'm talking to my account and I'm like, what is going on? Why didn't I get a credit card? She's like, oh, you don't have any credit. I'm like, what are you talking about? I don't have any credit. What are you talking about? She said, well, you personally, you buy things in cash. And I'm like, yeah, but I have a long history of life where I don't buy things in cash. She's like, oh yeah. But everything was in your ex-husband's name. Everything. Mm. House, credit cards. I'm like, I've had credit cards. She's like, no, he had a credit card. You had a user card. And so now I, I know him well, I know his brain is just like, Oh, I'm just like setting this stuff up, whatever. And we never saw a world where we weren't going to be together. So why would I need credit? But that's freaking wild, Doug. I am 38 years old. I have successfully run a business for a very long time. I am, I am very successful in, in terms of finances. I don't have any credit, bro. That's wild. That's crazy. And I did not know until I asked her, wait, why was it so hard for me to get a freaking Hawaiian airline credit card? It's like, oh, you didn't have any credit. And I just thought, damn, how many women and maybe men, I don't know, but usually it happens with women trust the process and you should trust your partner, but you should just know, you should yeah. just know that you own a home that your name's not on. Like that feels important. So that's nothing against him. That's just a very real story. And that's my fault, Doug. Mm. That's not his fault. That's my fault. Because I didn't ask questions and I wasn't informed and I didn't know. And so having something like that happen can trigger that voice in the back of my head that's like, see, you're an idiot. You should know these things. You should do better. You, I can't believe how, you know, whatever. Or I can go, okay, now you know. And there's power in knowing. And what are we going to do going forward so that we make better decisions? Yeah. And money can be so taboo, right? To talk about because people are like, oh my gosh, if that means I'm, if I'm going to start focusing on the money, that means that I might become obsessed with it. Or I might actually find out like, we're really not doing as well as we thought, thought we were, or I can't right, believe that this money's right. going out that way or, or whatever. But I think, I mean, I've heard somebody say this before that the competence breeds confidence. Like the more you know about something, yes. the better you'll feel about how to navigate those situations as they come about. And not that you'll always be perfect. You'll still always like learn along the way. But I think that's the the path to getting there is involved, keeping yourself involved and asking questions, and making sure you're having these tough conversations that we've talked about. I know one of the things that's been a challenge for you that you've been working on is focus and like you know, staying like being productive. Right. And it's hard enough to be focused amidst, you know, having a family, being a single mom and, and running a business and that sort of thing. Like, how have you been able to maintain focus or maybe what are some things that you're currently working on to remain focused in the midst of some of the chaos that you've gone through? So, I mean, I, there's definitely, there's a whole podcast about this. I won't go into the, all the details of my brain scan and um, some of the work that I was doing to understand why I was struggling with it so much. It's fascinating. Dr. Amen does fascinating work. And I found out like the actual reason that I'm having so such a hard time focusing. But beyond that, because I know not everybody can go get a brain scan tomorrow and sort of figure things out, what I have learned to do that's really helpful And this could be helpful for dudes, but this is really helpful for women. And if you're a guy and you're listening to this, don't roll your eyes, tell your lady, this is a thing, is women, at least nobody that I know, are not really raised. I mean, we're in a conversation, we're talking about health. We're not really raised to understand our cycle and how to work with our cycle instead of against it. And so different times of the month based on hormones that are happening within your body, you're going to have more energy. You're going to have more focus. You're going to have times of the month where you 
feel sluggish, where you feel tired, where maybe you feel stressed or your anxiety gets worse. In the course of a month, all sorts of different things happen. And if you track it, so this was a huge thing for me, was understanding what was going on. So for several months, I just did a daily a note in my cell phone. And I would say like, feeling anxious today or woke up feeling really sluggish, took me most of the day to get my energy level up. I tracked it for months. And then I compared and I saw a very clear, like, oh, the same thing happens on the same day every single month. If you're aware of what's going on in your cycle, then you can build your life, your business, your work around when you're going to do certain things best. And I would say not even just in the course of a month, but even the course of a day. So I have, I do, I create a lot of content, meaning like, I do my podcast, I do, I write, I do different things. I do that best in the morning. I cannot do in the afternoon. That's why you and I are having a podcast interview in the afternoon. Because this is the kind of work that I can do well in the afternoon. But if I had done the podcast with you in the morning, I wouldn't have been able to do my own podcast or write the email copy that I needed to write this morning. Because by the time I would have finished with you, I would be drained. So I learn how my body and brain works best and I don't fight it. I work with it. And maybe for men, that would be helpful too. Like if you know that you can freaking kill it from 4 a.m. to 6 a.m., do it. Like change your day to accommodate when you're going to be able to do the best work and then show up. Don't worry about what normally the rest of society is doing. If you work best, if you start at 4 a.m. and then you end your day at 2 p.m., and you have the ability to control that schedule, do that to the best of your ability. That is the thing that has helped me the most. You brought up a really good point. That's just being self-aware of what works best for you, you know, throughout certain times of the day, throughout certain times of the month, throughout certain times of the year, so that you can be productive around those windows. And I think it doesn't matter. Like you said specifically with you and and the women that are listening, like making sure that you're being more aware of like the hormonal cycles and how that impacts like your focus, your production and, and your energy and stuff like that. It's obviously from listening to you. And I'm, I'm sure just from just how you were explaining it, it's super important to do that. And I think from a guy's perspective too, if there's guys that are listening, like just knowing that like just becoming more aware of when you're feeling more quote unquote on, like when your energy is on and you just know that, wow, like things are flowing better. Now my thoughts are coming more easily. Like, I just feel like I'm just better at these times of the day Then maybe schedule the things that require your most energy during those times of the day. And then kind of bookend your days accordingly and make sure that you're taking care of yourself in the morning and in the evening and getting an ample amount of rest. And I know your audience is, predominantly women and your message over the years has, from what I understand, been getting people to stand up for what they believe in, staying true to who they are, feeling empowered as a woman and and that sort of thing. So has has your message changed now or is it going to change given, what's ha- given what you've gone through the past few years and what you've learned about yourself or is what you're talking about now or continuing to talk about going to be more of the same? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it, nothing nothing in terms of the intention behind the work has changed. I think that I've always been doing the same actions. The only thing that changes is me. And so you hear different stories or you experience different content for me based on where I am in my journey. I I say this and I think people think I'm joking, but really when I started out doing this work, the stories I was sharing, I was a blogger and I was telling you like how to make a casserole because that's all I knew. And then as I started to learn more things, I started to share more things. And, you know, I have talked about business during certain seasons of my life. I've talked about goal achievement during certain seasons of my life or health or because that's just what I was interested in at the time. And now today, there's a lot of conversations about like, what do you attract into your life and what are you manifesting and what energy are you putting out? And all of that is because it's the work that I've done all this year based on bad decisions that I made. I wanted to understand like, how did I get to this place and how do I make sure that I never show up as this person again? And so what you're getting now is the work that I did and have been doing because of that. So you'll just continue to see the content evolve as I continue to evolve. 
with that said, you talked about manifestation and law of attraction. Like what is, what are some things that you're looking to attract in your life over the next few years? Oh gosh. Um, well, I have a whole list, Doug. I got like, I got a bulletin board in front of me with pictures. I got all the things, but I think what the reason I love the conversation around what are we manifesting is the simplicity of just understanding that what you put out into the world is what comes back to you. You know, we started our conversation today by me, you know, learning that in the most publicly painful way, you know, but I love the idea that we have these conversations and I'm able to talk to women or like my three male listeners about what they're manifesting because it allows them to ask like, what kind of life do I want to have? And yeah, like I'm all about, if you want to manifest a new car, you want to manifest your dream job, great. But I'm more interested in you manifesting the person that you want to be. Mm. You know, are you someone who's radiating love? Are you someone who's changing your community? Are you someone who's put it like, because that requires intentionality. And I really just want to continue to figure out how I can be the best version of myself. Um, so yeah, like I have dreams, like I want to own a horse ranch here in Austin. (laughs) That's like a life dream of mine. But, um, in the short term, it just looks like literally if I'm going out in the world, if I'm driving to go to the grocery store, if I, you know, this morning when I was on my run, that I want to be a person, I literally want to be a person that if you see me out in the world, that I'm radiating joy and I'm radiating love and I'm saying hi to strangers and I'm like sending you good energy and um, that I feel like I go through my life looking for blessings and that I find them. And um, yeah, so it's it's more about the day-to-day and who I want to be, not necessarily like the big stuff. I love that. I love that you said that. And I think, yeah, I mean, I think our end goal as humans essentially is like, we want to be the person on the outside that we appear to be on the inside. Like the people, the person that we're presenting ourselves on social media is the person that we're presenting ourselves like in private and that we're doing the work consistently on who we are internally so that externally we can radiate like magic for people. We can radiate inspiration. We can be that light for other people when they're feeling down. We can be that light to inspire people to not give up on themselves. And I think that's what part of our due diligence is in the personal development space is to be that light. But I think it's also to be authentic and be real. And when you don't have it all figured out to just admit it and be like, you know, like my life's not perfect. Like I'm freaking struggling right now. And this is why I'm struggling. And here's how I'm getting through it. So that way you can use the situation in a way that's constructive and it's not just a situation to just go and vent online because I don't think that's necessarily the, the way out either. The, the last question I have for you is there's so many people that struggle mentally, emotionally, spiritually. And when they do, they go for the drink or they go and spend money where they shouldn't, or they go and they vent to their partner and create some sort of conflict in a relationship. Like what are the things that that you do when you're like having a bad day, you're in the thick of it besides journaling to keep yourself grounded so that you can respond in a way that's conducive with your highest self. I first just want to say to anyone who's listening, like I've been there. I've absolutely had more alcohol than I should have had. I've absolutely binged eat. I've uh, eaten. I have absolutely all the things that we do to numb ourselves to the way that we're feeling, I have used and abused and had to learn how to navigate around. I think that for me, the the key is that you want to be on offense, not on defense. So if I wait until I'm having a full-on anxiety attack to try and figure out how to handle my anxiety, I'm going to have a drink, maybe two. Uh, it, you know, if I wait until it's too late. If I'm already in it, I'm not going to make a good decision because I'm making a decision inside of a mind that's chaos. So for me, mental health and being emotionally resilient and strong and having the tools that I need is about having habits and routines inside of every day that I can lean on even when I'm having a hard day. Because 
you can't establish a good habit inside of a bad situation. You establish the good habits when it's feeling good or when it's feeling okay, so that you have something to lean on without thinking about. And I, it's about like, um, I can't for, I can't remember if I said this at the beginning, but stress relief, like really being on offense about stress relief. So meditation, therapy, long distance running, doing yoga, time with my friends, making sure that I have rest and the things that I need so that my, the things that I know will cause me anxiety, I'm constantly combating against, um, just to make sure that I don't get to a place where I'm going to reach for something that I shouldn't. And it's not to say that there aren't times that I like hundred percent, but I, my whole thing in life is that I only want to have a drink if it's in celebration, like, Oh, it's my birthday. I'm going to have champagne or whatever. But I would be lying to your face. If I said that there weren't times that I'm like, I'm going to have some vodka right now. Cause I've had a really hard day. And I think those end up being worse. Right. And this is, this is an important thing to remember is that I always think that the results or the ramifications of you making a choice like that are way worse than that moment was when you were inside and feeling like you needed it because you're making a decision in that moment for like the current version of you who wants your stress level to come down. Like, Oh, I'm going to have a cocktail and that's going to make me be a calmer parent, but you're sabotaging the future version of you. You're sabotaging yourself when you wake wake up tomorrow and you have a hangover. You're sabotaging yourself two hours from now when you realize that you broke a promise you made to yourself. And so could you have some things that you reach for that can give you the same result that you're looking for, but don't require a choice that's going to make you feel bad about yourself, which just then creates a loop of negativity where you keep feeling bad, reaching for the bad choice, then feeling bad that you reach for the bad choice and just doing it over and over again. It's hard to solve a, a long-term problem with a short-term solution. And you're so right. Like I think right. so many people, they they end up feeling, you know, terrible in a in a moment and they go and they reach for that drink. And then the drink feels good in that moment. That, but then like an hour later, they're like, why did I do that? Now I feel even worse. Right. And it's not just because of the feeling that maybe that substance gives them. It's the shame and the pain that comes with, I knew I was better than that. Like I knew I, it could have been right. so much simpler. And I knew I, would, I could have been strong to just say no in that moment. Because then when you start to say no and you sacrifice the short-term pleasure for the, the initial short-term pain, you get long-term pleasure. And that becomes like a muscle that you build so that every time you go through these hard moments, you really don't have to think about like, oh, like, what do I need to do? It's just second nature. Like, boom, like when, when can I get a run and boom, where can I meditate or who do I need to call? It's not like, well, I need a drink right now, or I need to go and eat this food. It's like, all right, I know that that doesn't serve me. Here's what has served me and has allowed me to feel better after the fact. And, the, and that are these things that are already kind of hardwired in your brain after practicing it for so long. Absolutely. So Rachel, this has been awesome. I, I thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. And I think people are going to going to want to connect with you if they haven't already and learn more about your work and what you have going on. So where's the best place for people to do that? Well, since they are podcast listeners, uh, you should check out the podcast called the Rachel Hollis podcast. Uh, and you can get it anywhere you get your pods. And uh, my favorite social platform is Instagram. I'm if you just type in my name, you'll find me there. She is there. And I will make sure to plug her information in the show notes And for those listening, there's a lot of takeaways in this with how openly Rachel shared about her healing journey, humility, how she's learned from mistakes, um, what she's up to now, what she's manifesting, how she's rebuilding her identity. And um, what I ask you is you to share a takeaway. Maybe it was something that she said um, about her healing journey or something that she said about how she's learning um, from her mistakes or what happened publicly earlier this year or how she, what she's doing to rebuild her identity, whatever that takeaway was, tag Rachel, tag myself, because we'd love to hear your feedback. We once again, thank you for listening to this episode of the Adversity Advantage. I'm your host, Doug Bobst. We'll see you next time.